Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Coach Summit 2022. I am the disembodied voice of Chris Knobloch. I will be taking care of some of the tech support on today's summit. Once again, thank you so much for joining us on the Coach Summit this year. Um, a reminder, once again, please turn off your camera and your microphone for the duration of the summit, if possible. Also, a reminder that this, is be this session is being recorded. Um, if at any point there's a question about this, please send me a direct message through the chat, and I'd be happy to answer it. It will be available in a couple weeks' time on BSUK's YouTube channel. If you have questions during the summit, please make sure to put them in the chat and I will be happy to raise them at the appropriate time. Of course, during the question and answer session, feel free to ask your own questions. That's all for me. And without further ado, let me introduce the MC for today. He is the head of development, has been with BSUK for 11 years now almost. Uh, it is Mr. Chris Rawlings. Chris, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Welcome everybody to this, the seventh from baseball soccer UK. Um, I'm sure several of you will have been with us back in 2016 and have Brian uh, Power of your repertoire and coaching. Uh, welcome to everybody, whether you are a familiar um, attending at these very I'm afraid Chris is having some technical issues there with his internet nine sessions uh, following this um, and i'll go into further details on those later throughout the uh, the coach summit um, the theme for this year's summit is adaptation relevant and resilience and the one thing i'm absolutely sure of is as we emerge from the pandemic uh, that it's effective for the, as for the past two years coaches and coaching will be absolutely crucial and central to our sports reigniting um, re-energizing and getting back to, to the levels of play that we were seeing back in 2019. Um, it's a great opportunity through the Summit Series to prepare for the new season, to be motivated to engage and listen to a, a high quality field of presenters and speakers, um, several of which are joining us today uh, and more of that uh, shortly. Uh, as Chris said, the um, Coach Summit Series is supported by the Baseball Outlet. Uh, please check them out for a discount um, as an attendee from the uh, summit today. Over the next 10 weeks, we're going to try and cover many aspects of coaching through technical, tactical, and even philosophical. A broad and balanced program, some high quality speakers from right around the world with different experiences uh, and different skills. Um, they will try and help uh, your learning as a coach, and it's great that you've chosen to spend uh, three hours on a Saturday afternoon uh, in our presence, listening to the, the presenters that we have today and really investing that time as for you as a coach. Um, as I've said, coaches will be so crucial over the next 12 to 18 months in, in getting baseball and softball back in this country to the levels of participation and performance uh, that we, we've uh, seen previously. Uh, as Chris said, uh, all the questions, um, if you put those through the chat, please, that would be much appreciated. Uh, and we will try and open up each of the, the presentations at the end to um, take some question and answers because I'm sure there'll be things coming out of the of the content that you'll want to um, uh, talk about and discuss further. Um, the programme today has four high quality speakers, um, Andre Lachance, more of whom I'll introduce shortly, followed by Rachel Watkins, Drew Spencer and uh, Gary Anderson. Um, and I'm thrilled that the, the programme is such a, a high quality today, um, and I'm sure you'll be entertained, stimulated uh, through the next three hours. Um, um, before I move on to the next section uh, with Drew and, and with Rachel, I just wanted to take a moment to recognise all of those uh, coaches in the country who were nominated, shortlisted and the winners of the British Baseball and Coaching Softball Awards. Hopefully you've seen those announcements coming out on uh, our social media channels uh, throughout the week. Um, and again, congratulations to everybody um, who's been involved in that from, from nominations to shortlist and to award winners. Um, I just want to pay particular um, uh, mention to all of the award winners, and I'll run through them uh, very quickly for you. So for the Baseball Youth Coach of the Year, uh, was Will Zucker from uh, Hearts Baseball Club, and the Baseball Adult Coach of the Year, Martin Andrews from the Leicester Diamonds Baseball Club. The Softball Youth Coach of the Year, Holly Ireland from the RBI Wales Programme in, in Cardiff. Uh, and the Softball Adult Coach of the Year, Trevor Sykes from the Coventry Blitz Softball Club. The Young Coach of the Year, uh, Jess Vernon from, amongst others, Bells Baseball, Bracknell Baseball and Softball Club and GB Baseball. 
and the Volunteer of the Year, Doris Hocking, for her work in Women's Baseball UK and the National uh, Women's Baseball Team. And for services to coaching, probably the most prestigious of these, uh, amongst other things, uh, for Ian over a very long period, uh, his contribution through the GB men's softball for the under-23s and under-18s um, to Ian Tomlin. So congratulations to everybody who's been involved in that. Um, uh, they're um, a highlight of the year in coaching awards for, for us. So congratulations again to, to everybody. Um, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes setting some context for the presentations that we're about to hear from, from Rachel and from Drew. Um, and I said this last year, and I'll say it again, I think we're very privileged to have access um, so readily to um, key national team coaches and managers from our national teams. I don't think there are many other sports where we have such um, uh, people who readily give their time to contribute to the coaching system that we have in this country. Um, which is, uh, I think, a fantastic uh, um, contribution from both of them. Hopefully you'll be aware that over uh, the last uh, 18 months, we, with the British Baseball Software, uh, Federation, the British Softball Federation and Baseball Software UK have been um, applying to UK Sports to draw down funding from what's called the National Teams Fund. Um, if you're not aware, UK Sports are the government agency uh, who administer investment into the Paralympic and Olympic sports. And as a result of both baseball and softball being readmitted into the Tokyo program, uh, we've now been able to access further funds for to support the national teams. Um, and with that becomes accountability, but also some resource invested into uh, the, the running of the national teams and also the establishment of a, a performance system. Uh, and you'll be meeting Gary Anderson uh, shortly uh, later in the afternoon when we welcome him to the agenda. Um, so. Uh, the investment that we receive obviously comes with accountability, it comes with scrutiny, but also with outcomes attached. Uh, and we're at the very start of that program and that journey. And I'm delighted that both Rachel and Drew are able to, to, to join us today to talk about um, the road to Los Angeles 2028, the investment now and some of the key things that are going to happen over the next seven to eight years. So without further ado, I'd like to, to welcome Rachel Watkins, again, uh, a perennial contributor, contributor to the Baseball Softball UK Coach Summit. Um, made, Rachel, since 2015, has been the GB National Team's um, fast pitch team head coach, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome Rachel back uh, to the summit. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, I can't believe this is the seventh one. I think I've been privileged and lucky enough to speak at quite a few of these. So um, it's it's really nice to be back. Um, just like just while I get my my um, share my screen and things, I just want to also just reiterate what everyone else has said. Congrats to all the people who are nominated for awards, um, in particular for those who won. Um, it's it's a real privilege to be in the position in this country where volunteers, because we're all volunteers, get acknowledged so readily. Um, and in particular, I just want to say congrats to Holly and Ian, obviously two coaches who I've worked a lot with over the years, and I'm really proud of you. I think it's it's you know an amazing achievement. So well done to you guys before before we crack on, because obviously without um, without uh, the volunteers, you know it's it's a really um, the sport wouldn't be where it is now. So what I wanted to do today is just give you an idea. Um, I was asked to to tell you a little bit about what the program is doing now and what we want to be doing um, or need to be doing to get to LA 2028. And Gary, you'll meet a little bit later this afternoon. He will probably fill in some of the gaps that I might leave out. But in a nutshell, um, I just want to sort of summarize where we've come from, where we're going to, um, and fill you in on some of the, the things that we're going to be doing over the next few years, because 28 is only is, well, six, six years away now. So um, a lot has to happen really quickly. So. Um, just, I think one of the, my biggest things is in order to look forward and to be able to, to plan for 2028, I think it's really important that we reflect on where we've been um, and where we've come from. And in front of you on the slide, there's a selection of photos um, going back uh, from 2000 and uh, Venezuela, I think so 2010, which was the, the first kind of really big world championships that the GB women qualified for. I was lucky enough to be involved as a player uh, that year. We'd won a silver medal, the highest ever performance that we'd, we'd ever, um, the women had ever had at a, at, an, um, at a Europeans. And looking then forward to 2019. So what I'm gonna do is talk you through a little bit of the history of GB women's, just because a lot of people think it's still quite new, um, including some of the current players, um, and tell you what we've been doing since, 
sort of since 2019 when we last were all lucky enough to to take the field in a professional game as, as such so um we put this together in december we we relaunched the women's program um, we, we being the BSF, the women's coaching staff and BSUK thought it was really important that we, we reach out to all of the current um, and potential playing group and tell them what our plans were for the next few years. And so we put together a bit of a presentation. So some of these slides do come from that. Um, so some of you might have seen this before, but basically the first European Championships for, for women in Europe was in, in 1979. And we, Britain had a team. And you can see throughout, um, up until the 2009, where we won the silver, there's been a number of medals won and a number of teams compete, including lots of Olympic qualifiers over the years, because obviously softball, baseball was put back into the Olympics in 96, um, up until the last one uh, for, for 2008 in Beijing. And then since my involvement as a player from about 2009, um, we won a couple of medals. And then we've won, you can see more recently, some bronzes at, um, uh, at European Championships and silvers at Super Sixes. And obviously, um, some of you might remember in 2019, we were one win away from being the lucky team from Europe and Africa. Got, they got to go to, to Japan and compete. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, thankfully, the Olympics were delayed a year. I think I said this last year that it wasn't as painful. And the, the softball program at the Olympics was absolutely exciting to watch. I think we were all a bit zombies for the for the whole um, sort of week that it was on, watching in the middle of the night and the, the gold medal game, if you haven't seen it, get out there and, and look it up on YouTube. It was fantastic. But um, obviously from 2019, we finished on, well, a bit of a low, but on a, on a, on a crazy high. Um, and it was all plans for the next year. And then we all know what happened. And for the last two years, we haven't been able to do very much. We have each year selected a team. We've gone through all of the process and the players have been phenomenal, you know, being very resilient, being a theme of the day, you know, doing their, their trial data and everything else in their, their kitchens, in their garden sheds, on snow fields, um, footpaths, because it was the only ground that they could find in COVID times when we weren't allowed to leave the home. Um, and we were able to pick squads in both 2020 and in 2021. But um, 2020, obviously the world, nothing happened. 2021, we could have gone to the Europeans, um, but it wasn't the safe or the right choice to make. And I think, thankfully we didn't, because apparently the night before, um, when when Pete, the, the, our tournament, the TU, the tournament chief umpire turned up and sort of, they said, is anyone coming from Britain? It was like, no, good, because we would have had to go into self-isolation. So we wouldn't have gotten to compete anyway. Um, so, We've had a bit of a hiatus. We haven't been able to get together and do very much, but that doesn't mean that not much has actually been going on because it, it really has been. Um, Chris just mentioned that from, from 2019, there was a small group of us um, initially trying to, to, to win some funding. Um, at that point, it was called the Aspiration Fund. And that's, we had to put together a big presentation on what it takes to win. Um, and that was a fantastic opportunity for us. Um, Liz and myself, Liz being, works with me with the women's team um, to, to really look at what the best in the world did and realizing that in order for us to be the best in the world, we can't have what they've got, we need more. So it gave us a chance to be really analytical, to look at what the best countries in the world do, what we need from our athletes, what we have, um, and then start to put together um, a, a vision, I guess, for, for GB women's softball. And unfortunately, we weren't successful at that point, although they were very happy with what they saw. And when, um, when in 2020, we started putting together a bid for um, the National Teams Fund. So the UK sport have really changed their funding and we've been really lucky to benefit from that. So again, BSUK and BSF at that time, we had a working group ranging from people from people involved in much in grassroots developments within the UK, right the way through to some, some ex-coaches, Craig, Craig Montevides, obviously Bob Fromer, massive um, figurehead in, in British softball, all sat around a, a Zoom call and worked out how we would pitch this idea to UK sport that we could be on a podium in, in 2028. And thankfully, this group of UK sport um, analysts uh, who are incredibly smart, they're not easily fooled, 
they are critical they are they investigate everything that we put out there and they agreed with us and they gave us um, 288,750 pounds to spend for what they call the Paris cycle. So that takes us through until the Paris Olympic Games. Um, so it was an amazing present to get last March. And it, it was a real, um, it was a real privilege to have been part of that process. And, and I felt very honored as the sort of figurehead of that from a women's team point of view. But um, as I keep saying to the athletes, that it's all about them. They are the reason we got it. And UK Sport believe we can be on a podium so we can medal in 2028. So we've got this funding to spend. And I'm sure as Gary will explain later on, there's lots of other pots of money. And as long as we set our targets and we meet our targets or exceed them, then there's every likelihood that we'll be able to secure more funding to take us through to LA 2028. Um, it's, Chris, as Chris mentioned, it comes with a lot of responsibility and a lot of um, a weight on the shoulders. And it's a little bit scary. And I keep having to remind Gary that we are a group of amateur volunteer coaches now working with a very professional program. And because of that, an awful lot is going to have to change. We're going to have to adapt and we're going to have to be very resilient. So the theme of this year's summit really does reflect um, what we're going to be doing over the next sort of Four, four to six years. Um, so the big thing for us is that, um, if I go back, is it's more about, and, and Andre touched on this, it's about the process. So what we have to do now and what we're working on with, with Gary's leadership um, and experience is working out what, what we have to do between now and the sort of major competitions that we have coming up over the next few years to ensure that we actually do make the LA 20, um, 2028 Olympics. So it is very much about that journey and it's being a, having a really hard, honest look at ourselves and where we are currently, what we have currently and, and how we move forward. And we are gonna be responsible at every point to UK sport. Uh, it's very different to what the model that we've worked under before, but thankfully because of the hard work that started way back in, in 2007, eight by Hayley Scott and her coaching staff that's been carried through and with the, the joined up approach of the women's program and now more, even more so the whole fast pitch program, men's and women's, and even bringing in the slow pitch to some extent, the professionalism and the, um, the approach that we are taking for a very small amateur sport, um, we really try and lead by example and be as professional and as um, and driven by science and, and, and data as much as we physically can be. So because we couldn't do very much last year, we have sort of, we, we left everything on pause. Very quickly in December, when it was clear we were gonna have um, our new head of performance systems, Gary, joining us, we, we sort of had a chat with BSUK, with John Boyd and sort of said, we need to get things going. This needs to happen now. So we decided that we put a little email out to some of our, our sort of women's program players who've been in the program a long time and sort of said, if we could get you to Florida in January, would you would you come? And very, very quickly, much to our you know, delight, the vast majority of players were able to come. Not all could, but most could. So then we extended it out. So just last weekend, um, there were, we invited 20 20 athletes, some of whom are, are players um, like Chloe Wigginton, Lauren, um, Lauren Evans, Georgina Corrick, who've been in the program for, for a long time. We then brought in some players who had been selected into the women's team over the last two years, but because of COVID hadn't been able to, to travel with us. So someone like Morgan Salmon. And then we also reached out to the U22 and the U18s head coaches and said, look, which, which players do you see as, 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 as tracking as potential athletes in the future? And they gave us a series of names. So our, our youngest athlete is was 15. Um, our eldest was a little bit older than that, but all phenomenal athletes and we were able to get them together for a training camp um, unfortunately because of my job I wasn't able to be there but the other coaching staff were and with some um, support from some local a local coach as well uh, we were able to run the training camp play some scrimmage matches and it was exciting to watch I mean I wasn't able to see it all but through 
cameras and through video messages and things like that. I got to see BP, I got to see some of the scrimmage games live, some of the fielding practices live. And it's really exciting to see um, to see what we have coming through uh, the, the GB Women's um, Program. Now, obviously, this money that we've been given isn't for grassroots development. It's for being on the podium, which means we're gonna to have to make really hard decisions both about ourselves and about the athletes that we select. And it's not always gonna be the popular choice, but we have to ensure that we are, um, we are on the podium. So you'll see a, a definite shift in the way that the women's team operates over the next few years, because we have to but we hope that we will be able, everything we do will benefit not just the junior national sides, 22s, 18s, 15s, 13s, but fast pitch in general in the UK. We wanna try and make sure that we leave the place in a, in, in a better place than we found it in. Um, and that's always been our goal is leave, leave the sport better um, and give, hopefully give enough back that inspires others to wanna to give to the game as well. So, um, so with this money, we're hoping that we're able to do that. Um, so January 2022 training camp kicked off our program um, with success and the feedback so far has been fantastic from everyone. So the next year for us is huge. So 2022 is a, a European year. Again, there's been a lot of Europeans um, for softball. We started off December last year, end of, end of the year, moving up three rankings in the world. We don't quite know how that happened considering we haven't, not one GB women's or female fast pitch team took a diamond since 2019, but we've gone up three places and we'll take it. We're not gonna complain. Um, unfortunately, because we didn't compete in Europe and despite a lot of reassurances that the only, that we wouldn't be affected by not being able to compete last year because of COVID, we have taken a plummet in the European rankings. What that means for us is that we have a slightly longer European Championship to plan for, but we see that as an opportunity rather than there's an, at, a, at a disadvantage for us. Um, so it's, it's kind of funny that we're 12th in the world, but we're 16th in Europe. It doesn't make much sense, but then the world rankings are a little bit different to European rankings. So what this year basically means for us is we're going to go through a selections process that will be a little bit different to normal because of the influence of UK sport and the professionalism that Gary and will bring in the experience from other sports. Uh, so we'll, we'll be going through that process very, very soon. We are planning on um, lots of training camps um, and longer training camps is our goal. And we're about to um, start planning for all of those now that we've, we've sort of finished the January training camp. So Whereas in the past, we've, we've always come to Europe and we've trained this year that the intention is that we, whoever's selected from Great Britain and any staff from Great Britain will travel to North America and we'll do a training camp there, giving the players from here enough chance to acclimatise to, to North America before we play some really high calibre competition. Um, before flying back to Spain, um, again acclimatising and then taking on the, the Europe's best in the goal of finishing top three so that we qualify for the World Cup the year after that. Uh, and if we manage that, then we'll have hopefully exceeded um, what, what goals were being set and therefore we'll be ticking boxes with UK sport and winning and hopefully getting some, some being able to access some more pots of funding. So um, the European Championships are in Spain uh, towards the end of, of July. So it's gonna be very hot. So we're gonna have to invest a lot in technology and in those training processes to make sure that players and staff are able to compete. In 2008, 9, we played in the south of Spain as well um, for, for, the, for the Europeans and it was, it was horribly hot. So we are gonna have to be, make sure our athletes are incredibly fit and healthy and that we use every bit of an advantage that we get through the UK sport funding. And that's something that we're very excited about. For the first time ever, we're gonna have access, not ever, but the first time in, in my memory since the last lot of Olympic funding that was provided to British softball, we're gonna have access to all the things that other elite level athletes get, the psychology, the nutrition, the sports medicine, all of those things that we've done the best with, um, that we've, you know, best that we could do over the last few years, we're gonna get access to, and we're quite exciting. I was excited by that. 
after Europeans, who knows, we haven't quite planned that far yet. There may be other competitions that we choose to go to um, uh, uh, as the year progresses, but there'll definitely be ongoing remote monitoring using all sorts of different technology. We have blast motions and push bands and things that we invested in in the lead up to the Olympic qualifier that made significant difference to our athletes and it made it much easier for us as coaches being around the world um, to monitor and coach from afar. There'll be more training camps, um, more competitions for us to go to. And, um, and it's looking like a really exciting period of time for us. The most wonderful thing is that, and this is sort of what I've said to our athletes is, this is our chance as a sport to invest in them. They've always had to financially invest in themselves. We now get to invest in them and try and make them the best athletes that they can be and the best coaches that we can be. I've already been involved in conversations about what CPD opportunities there are for, for us as staff to ensure that we can give the athletes the best that, that they deserve really. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're trying to sort of instill in the entire program is this is a whole program approach. And the world rankings that you see in front of you are not just based on the women's team. They're based on all of the, the female programs. So we, we need to ensure that the U18s, U22s and the women's team are competing with the best in the world, winning against the best in the world, so that as a nation, we continue to move up. We need to ensure that we continue to work as one big unit, that we're not working in silos and that we help each other and we support each other because there's some phenomenal coaches within the women's program college coaches, um, coaches who are volunteers but have more knowledge than in, in their, their sort of their, their banks, banks of wisdom than, than most of us have, you know, in our little fingers, they're so clever. So we need to be able to draw on them and that's what we hope to be able to do. Um, it's, it's really important that you can see from this, this slide here, what we've got planned from, from this year until LA 2028. So you can see that we've got lots of different competitions and the women's programs, World Championships have very well, World Cups have really changed since the last time that World Cup was in, in Japan. It's no longer just a case of qualifying and winning in Europe and then getting to the World Championships. We now have to go through group stage qualifications in 2023 and that's what we'll be looking to do this summer. And then if we win those, we'll go into the finals. So it's a much more competitive way of getting to the World Cup. But if we want to be on the podium in 2028, that's what we have to be able to do. We have to be able to beat the best that the world has to offer. And it's quite exciting to think about how well we did uh, in 2019 with relatively small pots of money and um, limited resources and what we might be able to do with what in most sports would say is pocket money, 288,000 pounds for us. It's an eye-watering amount of money that we can use really, really well. And as I said, you can see there right from the U15s, everyone is on board with this. We've got, as I said, we had 15 year olds at our, comp at our training camp last weekend. The women's program, if you look at the average age of the athletes in, in the Olympics, was um, well well into their, their 20s. The best two pitchers who pitched in the gold medal games, they were all in their mid to late 30s. So we have a very young team, and that's exciting because hopefully once 28 is done, there's, there's Brisbane and, and the game will be in there, and then hopefully we'll be in forevermore, and that's what we'd like to see happen. So... Um, I think I'm I think I'm almost out of time. Um, but basically what's required for us is a lot of sacrifice. But I quote Georgina Corrick, who's one of our pitchers for the women's team, when she was interviewed less than an hour after missing out on that spot in Tokyo and and it was the, the telegraph rang and they spoke to her and they asked her about sacrifices she's had to make to to be part of the GB women's team. And and she said they're not sacrifices, they're choices. And therefore we have lots of choices to make over the next few years to ensure that we secure more funding to help our athletes and our coaches throughout the whole program, that we qualify for 2028 and bring our sport, um, the, the, the sort of spotlight that it deserves to have on it from a, a British uh, publicity point of view, and then to get on the podium, which I'm sure you'd all agree would be an absolute highlight of most of our lives. So. Um, that's all I've got for you. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, I'm absolutely more than welcome to answer what I can. Um, if I can't answer it, I can certainly find out the answers. Um, so yeah.
Uh, thank you, Rachel. It was a very comprehensive um, overview of what's ahead of us. Andre, in his presentation, talked about bold moves and what, what that's going to look like for the next uh, year. I think we've probably got six years of, of bold moves ahead of us from, from what I've seen. Um, I'm just checking if there's any questions now. We can pause after Drew's presentation, which again is, is linked to the same uh, topic to pick up any questions or comments uh, people have from there. If that's the case, then um, we'll move on to, to Drew. Drew, thank you again for your time and support to help with the Coach Summit this year. You've been um, a longstanding contributor to um, the summit. It's great to have you on board and to see you. For those of you who've not met Drew before, Drew's um, following a, a long and uh, distinguished playing career in the States, has a, a track record with um, London Sports and London Mets Baseball Club in, in the UK as, as coaching. And then in 20, uh, September 2020, took on the manager of the GB national team's senior baseball uh, team, uh, leading them to a sixth place finish in the 2021 European Championships. So, uh, Drew, welcome. Lovely to see you. Um, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you very much, Chris. Just uh, checking everybody can hear me okay. Can you hear me, Chris? Yeah, all good. Great. I, I see a head nodding. Appreciate it. I'll go ahead and uh, start my presentation then. Uh, first of all, just want to really you know thank BSUK. Uh, for the opportunity to come in and talk about the GB baseball program. I have attended every one of these events since bar one um, due to a family uh, commitment and they're always fantastic and it's just a real pleasure to kind of have jumped onto the other side you know from from the audience onto the stage as it were and to get a chance to talk a little bit about Great Britain baseball. <clears throat> so you know it's, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to get this opportunity um, as the lead program manager and the head coach for the program um, to speak on behalf of the work and effort of a number of people, um, you know, and, and to be, you know, the kind of the face of that for, for the purposes of today um, is a tremendous honor and something I don't take lightly, um, but is definitely everything I'm talking about is the work of, of a great number of people, a fantastic number of volunteers, and I'll get into that in a little bit in a second. Um, before I do, I just have to take one moment, I hope everybody won't mind, um, to just uh, mention that, um, you know, a year ago uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, the British baseball community lost uh, someone really, really special and really important who's been with us for a very long time, Tanya Kramen, um, who passed away, uh, sadly, uh, you know, very young and very surprisingly um, one year ago, so 30th of January last year. Um, and I know that her family and extended family, which includes all of us in British baseball, will be thinking about her and missing her tomorrow. And, and her son, John Kramen, who's a big part of our program, uh, we'll, we'll understandably be having a pretty tough day tomorrow, um, but, it, you know, I wanted to make sure, uh, you know, I always start my presentations off with who I'm thankful for, um, and, I, you know, Tanya, I can't say enough about, she was the first person to welcome me when I stepped into the world of adult baseball, and means a lot, um, so just for Tanya, thank you so much, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, I'm sure, without you and without your son, and uh, we miss you. Continuing with the attitude of gratitude, um, you know, I believe wholeheartedly that, you know, coaches, um, you know, we impact people's lives far beyond what happens on the field. Um, and so it's always important for me to start by thanking all the coaches that have been part of my life, you know, right from, from mom and dad, who were the first people to put a ball and baton in my hand, right through to guys like, you know, Liam Carroll um, and Antoine Richardson, um, who's a new one on this list compared to what you saw last year, um, but who's been instrumental in helping me, uh, you know, um, guide the British national team, baseball team uh, towards some of its success. Um, but just continuing with that, some guys, you know, that I, I couldn't have thanked as much a year ago that I can now. Um, what you're seeing here is just the entire coaching staff of the men's senior national team and the under 23 team, um, whose performances in the last year we'll talk about in a second, um, but were remarkable. Um, and it doesn't happen without the names you see on here. Um, you know, I think Rachel pointed out that, you know, everybody's volunteer when it comes to uh, the diamond sports here in the UK. Um, nobody's being paid. Um, we're all, um, you know, doing it for the love. Um, and, you know, our coaching staff, I genuinely believe is the best in Europe um, and, um, you know, among the best in the world. When you just think about the, the individuals involved, you know, the list you see there in, includes members who have been who have played for the Great Britain national team at just about every level. You have members of the British Baseball Hall of Fame. You have three different people who are employed by Major League Baseball or Major League Baseball related organi organizations. Um, you know, you have uh, a world class strength and conditioning team. Uh, you have a scout for the New York Mets and, uh, and my college teammate 
and you have a player who's you know you know a young man who's uh who's been part of great britain baseball since he was you know eight nine years old and you know and, and has loved british baseball his whole life uh, so it's a fantastic group of people i get to work with and uh, it's always worth acknowledging and thanking them in particular for uh the performance that that they helped our players to uh, create in the last 12 months but i i would it would be remiss of me not to mention some people who aren't on the coaching staff, but who equally, you know, went above and beyond and made some fantastic contributions to Great Britain baseball in the last year, starting with Glenn Robertson, who's, uh, I think, for 12 or 13 years now has been the director of operations, uh, you know, never played the game, you know, has no kids who's played the game, just loves British baseball, loves being a part of GB. Um, and, you know, the amount of time and effort um, and sometimes money that he puts in uh, to make sure that, that, you know, we're able to field a team um, and that that team has everything they need so that they don't have to think about anything but what happens on the field. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's beyond what anybody could ever imagine. And Glenn deserves all of our, our gratitude and respect. Um, but just running down the list, Mariana Casal, who recently took on the role of head of communications and made sure, make sure on a daily basis that everybody knows the newest and latest news for Great Britain baseball. Uh, Gaetano Cristiano, um, who actually is, was a native Italian speaker who jumped on a plane to come down to Turin. Um, and join our delegation to make sure that we were able to communicate with all the people that were organizing the European Championship, some of whom didn't have very strong English, and a lot could have got lost in translation, and we, we would have been really lost without him. You know, Ivan Quackenbush, who played for the under-23s, um, and then, you know, on his own dime, stayed, um, and, you know, stayed through um, in Turin to be the bullpen catcher for the senior national team, but who's also an accomplished graphic designer in his own right and all the beautiful graphics that you saw during the tournament. And since then, we're all designed by Ivan in his own time, uh, just off of his own back because of how much he loves Great Britain baseball. And, and I'll be forever grateful to him, not only for that, but then for getting into the squat every single night and, ke and catching bullpens for our pitchers in the senior national team tournament, despite the fact he wasn't on the roster. Uh, Chris Knobloch, as we all know, um, you know the voice uh, of, of baseball more and more in this country, um, who, who again, you know, took time out of his schedule and came down to broadcast our games. I think we were privileged enough for him to have reached the broadcasting milestone while he was there. And, you know, I think his voice will forever be embedded in our minds as we remember, you know, the fantastic season we had. Um, and I think we got to be one of the only uh, baseball programs in the whole world that has our own artist. So Andy Brown, who again traveled down and captured every single one of our games and plenty of moments in between in paint. And Paul Stoddart, who captures all the beautiful photography of our tournaments. And again, you know, jumps in a van and drives down from Holland just to be with us for a couple of weeks, you know, making endless trips to and from the airports to pick players up no matter what time or day or night that their flights came in and who was a big help to Glenn this year um, in terms of all the operations, but also single-handedly ensured that the Great Britain baseball shop got online, which meant that fans and, you know, uh, people all around could, could purchase Great Britain baseball gear um, which helps us because, as we all know, money is, is in short supply um, and to make sure that, you know, GB baseball fans could show their support. So just some people whose names definitely deserved recognition um, for me. And, and, and I needed to make sure because anything that we do between now and L.A. 2028 and all the tournaments between, you know, that, that will come before that, they don't happen. We don't have the success without the people like you see here who aren't in the dugout, who aren't coaching, who aren't, you know, um, getting to put on a uniform. But who contribute in, you know, in ways that just blow my mind, you know, just because they love the country, love the program, love the game. So uh, got to make sure I thank all them. But anyway, like Rachel, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start talking about 2022 and beyond by first recapping 2021. Um, so I saw you guys all a year ago and I, and I said, you know, we were doing some things, right? We were evolving the GB way and looking for ways to take all of the amazing work that Liam and the coaches before him did and translate it for a new generation. Um, we were looking at baseball as an infinite game. You know, it's easy to think about trophies and medals and God, one day I hope to have as many medals on a slide as Rachel just had for softball for the baseball program. Um, you know, but we're working there. But more importantly, what we have to think about is not just the next tournament. We have to think about the next 10 years and the next 20 years. And I challenge my staff, no matter where they're at in the program, to think in generations, not in tournaments, not in trophies. You know, and our goal is to build champions. You know, it's to make great human beings who understand what it's like to battle through adversity, you know, and, and to show up for your teammates and to compete and do your absolute best, um, you, you know, not only on the field, but off the field. You know, if you're a champion, uh, the championships will come. So we focus on champions, not championships. 
And I told you all that, you know, we, what we wanted to do was to connect the program up and to be an environment that allowed British baseball players to achieve their dreams so that, you know, it would be a true statement that no matter what your ambitions were in baseball, whether you live in you know, Leicestershire or whether you live in Los Angeles, you know, whether you're from Scotland or whether you live in Australia, if you've got a British passport and you have ambitions in this game, that we want to be a program that enables you to get there from here. So on to 2022, you know, how did it start? Well, it, you know, talk about adversity. It felt like a battle. It was, you know, the British baseball program versus COVID in, in almost every imaginable way. Um, and, you know, we were determined to, to be champions through it and to be adaptable and to adjust to everything that the pandemic threw our way, um, which, which included, you know, some, you know, some stuff a year ago today, um, you know, we were, you know, we were just on the verge of some major changes at the British Baseball Federation. Um, you know, the majority of the people that sit on the board of that organization weren't there, you know, a year or two ago. So it's, it's all new faces um, and a brand new landscape, which presents, has presented some fantastic opportunities for change, but it's also meant a bit of a learning curve um, and, you know, and, and figuring out, you know, kind of where to get some ground and get our footing. You know, our U-12s had to pull out of their uh, championship that they were in, um, which was a, was a heartbreak to a, a group of people who'd spent a lot of time, you know, prepping and getting themselves excited to go and compete. Our U18 uh, qualifier postponed. So again, another group that had spent a tremendous amount of time getting ready to play um, that didn't get to do so. And then, you know, obviously a, a really exciting event for the sport and just for the world, right? The Women's European Baseball Championship and GB's first entry into that, again, postponed. Um, so lots of exciting stuff that, you know, COVID's just stepping in and going, you know, not, not this time, um, you know, but all, also opportunities for us to kind of, you know, again, you know, demonstrate the kind of perseverance and, uh, and, and, you know, challenge and, and ability to overcome challenges. Um, but then some good news, you know, as we got ready for some of our tournaments, you know, we found that, um, you know, we moved up a spot in the world rankings from 33 to 32nd. And we're hoping, you know, as we moved into the two tournaments that did happen, which were the under 23s and the senior European championships that, that, you know, with a little bit of luck, a little bit of hard work and, you know, in the right kind of effort and, and selfless, relentless attitude that we could move up. <coughs> More on that in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but uh, well, throughout it all, I think what we reminded ourselves is what we were about. And in fact, we learned something about ourselves last year. And that was that the statement that we had a year ago, which was about being an environment that enabled British baseball players to achieve their dreams, needed to evolve. Um, and it was actually, you know, something that came from one of our newest coaches, uh, Chris Ward, um, who's part of the U12 and was a nominee for services to coaching this year, um, a very well-deserved nomination. Um, who pointed out that, you know, he wanted, he, he came and, and really wanted to be part of British baseball or part of the GB baseball program. And he said to me that he wanted to take the, you can get there from here statement and make that true for coaches as well. And it made so much sense. Um, so we made this, you know, we've made this, we've evolved our statement. Um, so we're here to be the environment that not just, that doesn't just enable British baseball players to, co to achieve their dreams, but that propels them to. Um, so it's about accelerating people's path. And that's true for the players, but we need that to be true for the coaches and the staff, because to be successful, as Rachel pointed out, you know, it takes mental skills, it takes technology, you know, it takes expertise and a lot of stuff that has a lot, you know, more to do with bats and balls and gloves and, you know, and, and you know, all of that sort of stuff. It, it's, it's, it's a whole, you know, managing a baseball program or any sports program in the modern era um, takes a lot of expertise. So we need to make sure that we're in an environment that's propelling everyone forward. And that's, that's a big modification that we've changed, which is something that we took stock of and brought with us to the two opportunities that we did get to compete. And with that, I wanted to just show you the a little bit of the excitement that we took with us as we moved into 2022. And with the uh, fantastic skills of Paul Stoddart and Chris Knobloch, we put something like this together. <laughs>
still gives me chills. Thank you, Chris. That was such a beautiful piece of work. So how do we do? Um, I think we'll start with the senior national team. Um, there you see the whole group, you know, from the team artist to the strength and conditioning guy to our local Italian, right away to all the players that played on the team. Um, it was a fantastic group. And uh, we finished sixth overall in Europe. You know, we made it to a, a quarterfinal, uh, had a fantastic game against the Dutch. Um, and, you know, it was just a, all around a, a brilliant time, right? Seven domestic players, you know, guys that have played youth baseball here in the UK, making their debut for the men's senior national team. We had three new players join the program from the British Virgin Islands and a domestic coach, you know, someone who played youth baseball at Finsbury Park, put on the jersey and was part of the coaching staff for the men's senior national team for the very first time. Just, you know, again, proving that you can get there from here. Um, but then supplemented with just talent from all over the world and people who are so proud to put the uniform on and compete for us. And, you know, you can see, you know, just the camaraderie that existed in that group. They were a fantastic group of people to be, to be around. And probably the most, you know, the most rewarding part of this experience for me was on this last night here when we finished the game 8-5 against the Czech Republic in, this, in the fifth place game. Um, and, you know, we, we went down to the Czechs. And, you know, we were there, they were waiting for, they, we, they couldn't get us off the field. We were so busy thanking everyone and hugging everyone and just, you know, just, just trying to soak up the moment. Um, but, you know, two of our most senior players on the team, you know, one was Dan Cooper, who's played for GB a number of years, who just said, you know, this program's on its way. This is the most fun I've ever had playing for GB in my whole life. I really want to, you know, he thanked all the young guys um, and, and said he couldn't wait to get back and compete again. You know, and then and then, you know, it, it, it was just you know, just absolutely fantastic. And Alex Webb, starting pitcher, who told who told everyone that, you know, uh, following the end of his professional career and a little bit of, you know, European baseball, he was starting to fall out of love with the game and life was taking him in another direction. And he looked at all these guys and he said, you guys made me fall in love with baseball again. And I can't wait to come back and compete with you all compete with you again. So just really, really amazing group group of players. Um, and, you know, I know that they did everyone proud because we saw all the fantastic support from people back home and you saw it in the way they played. But, hey, not to be outdone, our under 23s uh, finished fourth overall, you know, so this fantastic group of players, which included, you know, again, a number of players who've grown up here with youth, ba youth baseball in the UK mixed in with, you know, international players. We had a, a day, you know, we had a, a debut from a player who started in Scotland. You know, we had a debut from a, from a player who's 18 years old coming out from Colorado, you know, just, uh, you know, a high school player who, you know, so just the, the range of, of, of talent and personalities in this organization um, was just fantastic. And they got after it on the field and, and competed their hearts out um, and finished fourth overall, which was the under 23's highest ever finish, you know, besting our fifth place finish in 2019, um, you know, with, with a really gutsy, you know, gutsy, gutsy performance you know, um, including, a, you know, a semifinal game um, against the Netherlands that, you know, um, you know, they came and they came after us um, and competed really hard. And then after the game told us how glad they were that there's another team in Europe that they have to worry about now, um, which was such a fantastic compliment. But what was great about this team was, you know, they placed fourth in the tournament. But I think if you ask anybody in, you know, in the city of Verona, we were first in everyone's hearts. Um, they were just absolute class act, had fun, you know, we're just fantastic to the local hosts, fantastic to the town, and, and really would have done you guys proud um, as a group of young men representing you and your families in this country. Um, and, you know, and just, to, just, you know, just again, because, you know, it's easy to show a team photo and, you know, that doesn't always give you a sense of what it was like. You can see just from this selection of images, you know, the camaraderie, you know, the teamwork, uh, you know, upper middle after every game, we had three baseballs. Um, which, you know, which, which the guys handed out to each one another, each had a different theme on it and the players would award, you know, who had the most guts, who had the most heart, um, you know, in each game, you know, you can see how the local community upper right got into it, you know, we had fantastic fans come to see us, you know, middle, we had the ugly shirt night with the under 23s ugly shirt dinner night, you know, just lots of team building, you know, bottom middle, the hotel, we, they loved us so much, the, the hotel staff wanted to take photos with us and bottom right was probably the most touching story. That's a young boy, uh, you know, from the from the local town in you know just outside Verona where we were playing, you know, who, who's battling cancer at the moment and wanted nothing more than to get a shirt of all the teams that he watched to play. He wanted a shirt from Great Britain Baseball and sent us a beautiful video that will bring tears to your eyes if you go on our Facebook page just thanking us for his GB baseball shirt. Um, so just, you know, really, really exciting time and just kind of proves the point that, you know, the goal is champions here. It's not championships. It's about being good people, being good teammates, learning how to compete, focusing on the right things, 
you know, being somebody that makes Great Britain proud, makes their teammates proud, makes their families proud, you know, and, and for me, that's what's going to lead toward the, the type of success that will see us through the kind of tournaments that we need to compete in and do well in on our path towards LA 2028. And what's beautiful is when you focus on champions, not championships, and when you think in generations, you know, good things happen on the field as well. Um, so, you know, what makes me laugh is when I, when I was appointed uh, the lead program manager and, and, you know, kind of moved up in my role, um, you know, to, to have oversight of the whole program, I had a hilarious conversation with the, the past president of the British Baseball Federation. He said to me that he wanted to go to the AGM and tell everyone that they were confident that we would make it into the top 25 um, in the next year. And we had a big argument about this because I said to him, it's, it's, it, listen, you know, uh, I can't promise that, you know, that's, that's a gutsy thing to say. And, 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 and again, you know, we're thinking about the next 10 years, not the next year. So I don't want to make promises about 12 months um, and get, Hey, take, take a look. You know, we moved up nine places. Uh, we're now ranked 23rd in the world. Um, we were among the top climbers of any country in international baseball in the whole world. And it was just a really fantastic way to culminate, you know, a, a really magical, you know, and historic year um, for British baseball, you know, and, and, and made us all really proud. And it's something that, you know, I hope all of you, are excited about as well. But just bringing us home, you know, so what's what's coming up? Well, 2022 is an action-packed year. Um, we have a, a qualifier for the U18s, a qualifier for the U15s, and a qualifier for the U12s in July. So all three teams in action in the same month. Um, and then, you know, and I hate to play favorites. You're never supposed to have a favorite, but I definitely do this year. And that is that our women's baseball team is going to compete for the first time ever wearing a Great Britain jersey in France in August from the 1st to the 7th. I'm going to be doing my best to get down there. I hope all of you will as well. Um, but, but you know, there's a, a fantastic group of coaches and young women who are, are busting their tails right now to get ready to represent us for the first time. And it's just going to be such a magical moment that I'm really excited about. Um, and then in September, if, if our U18s, this is a talk about a tough schedule. If our U18s manage to, to get out of that qualifier in July, that team has to regroup again in September um, for the European Championships in the Czech Republic. You know, so, uh, you know, quite a lot to think about, not only for those players and for the staff, but for their families as well, because that's, you know, that's, that's two trips to Europe. Um, and then, this, you know, finishing sixth in Europe at the European Championships last year qualified us for a, a special tournament. So the men's senior national team will be playing what's called the Super Six, um, which is a fantastic opportunity for the top six teams in Europe to get some competition in, um, which for us should hopefully, if, if it all goes ahead, be a fantastic tune-up for the World Baseball Classic qualifier, which is, I think, something for baseball is, is, is interesting because, you know, we talk a lot about LA 2028 and God, who doesn't want to be an Olympian? You know, that's a fantastic opportunity. But we have this other tournament called the World Baseball Classic, um, which is put on by Major League Baseball, um, which, as if you've ever paid attention to it, generates some fantastic highlights um, and some amazing, you know, some amazing uh, you know, opportunities for baseball players to dream about. Um, in, in the past has featured stars like Jazz Chisholm in a Great Britain uniform, amongst other uh, pro professional players. Um, and I'm right now looking at a roster of about 50 individuals that we're hoping to submit to Major League Baseball um, to potentially play in that tournament if it happens this year. Um, but, you know, um, the World Baseball Classic is something baseball players really dream about playing in. And when you think about thinking in generations, if we qualify for that, it has the potential to change the, change the game for us because the prizes um, and, and you know, the prize money for teams that qualify um, is a significant amount of money beyond anything that we've been, you know, really able to raise on our own um, or, or look at from kind of funding in the last few years. So it's great to look at, to look at that as, as a potential, not only to, to get on a podium, um, in, you know, when, when the whole world is watching, um, but also to do something that would, you know, would, would impact British baseball players for the next 20, 25 years. So what are we doing to get there? Um, well, you know, this winter, uh, the U-12s, U-15s, U-18s, and the women's senior national team have all put together development squads and, and winter training programs. Um, you know, so we're running our own training this year um, for the first time in a while um, and just really focused on, you know, getting ourselves ready. And, and you know, uh, Mariana, you can see, has done a fantastic job on the right there showcasing some of the content. So if you're, if you're a TikTok user, check us out there. Otherwise, you can see little snippets of what we're doing on, on the BBF and, you know, on the BSUK sites and, and on the GB Baseball Twitter sites. Uh, we're focused on talent identification. So we're trying to find, you know, and identify players. And we're lucky because with, with tournaments like the World Baseball Classic, lots of people get in touch. And, and hey, guess what? Everybody loves a winner. So with success in Europe, more people are reaching out from the States. And, you know, more players here in the country are letting us know that they're interested in playing for GB. 
Um, so we're really focused on, you know, having identification days. So we'll have some in the spring and just, you know, tapping into the international network. Uh, we're trying to find summer leagues for all of our players. So, you know, players in the States um, and players here, making sure that they have places to play and using the connections I mentioned. So, you know, when you got three guys with major league baseball connections and a bunch of people that have tapped into college baseball networks and European baseball networks, you know, we're, we are proactively making sure that every one of our players has an elite place to play competitive games this summer. Uh, we're going to enter a team into the battle for Britain, um, which will be a chance for some of our developing players and those that are looking to get on our radar to come in and compete in the battle for Britain, um, you know, and have a bit of fun and interact with, with, you know, the other clubs and that are getting involved in that fantastic competition. Uh, we're looking at Prague baseball week and, and giving our domestic players a chance to go and compete um, on a team in the Prague baseball week, which is a fantastic tournament that a lot of European national teams enter, but also some club teams um, that happens in the Czech Republic. Uh, we're scheduling some international friendlies, so we're currently in conversation with a couple of other federations, well, one of which is going to come over here and play our U18s, hopefully, uh, in sometime in May. So, you know, watch this space. You might get to come see your U18 team compete locally um, and hopefully put together some mini camps, you know, probably not some, something as comprehensive as what softball has be, been able to do, but getting our players in the States to where our coaches are in the States for various long weekends um, and stuff throughout the year so that they can get that extra work in that we need to be successful. Now, lastly, how, you know, how can you guys help? Well, first of all, you know, spread the word, you know, make sure that, um, you know, please reshare our content, follow us online, tell other people when, when great things are going on with GB baseball, the more eyeballs that get, we get, the better, um, you know, come out and see us play. God, we'd love to see some of you in Barcelona uh, for the super six or, you know, when the World Baseball Classic happens, you know, it makes such a big difference to look up and see people wearing the Lion or wearing GB Baseball in the stands, you know, contact the BBF, you know, maybe make a donation or offer to volunteer your time, you know, every little helps, um, and that's not just true for Tesco. Um, and then, you know, a couple of more direct ways, you know, you can go to our brand new merchandise shop um, uh, and, and buy, buy yourself a, an official GB jersey or a shirt or a hat, and we're going to get some more merch up there this year. Or Andy Brown was kind enough um, to turn a bunch of his artwork into a book called Happy and Glorious, um, the Team GB European Story, um, which you can buy off of his website and 10% of the proceeds go directly to the GB baseball program. So, you know, lots of ways for you to cheer us on on our way. Um, and just to remind you, you know, um, as I close out, you know, our goal is to be an environment that propels British baseball players, coaches and staff forward to achieve their dreams. Um, and I want that to be more true this year than it was last year and, and every year from now on. Um, you know, for generations and generations. So, you know, please hope that uh, you guys identify with that mission, are excited about it, and we could use your help with it um, wherever possible. Um, and just end with this, you know, I said three, last year I said that we were considering three words that would help represent our program. And those three words have turned out to be true. And the first one is pride. You know, people are proud to be part of this program, but more importantly, we're a group of hungry, hungry lions that are ready to go and attack life and attack the game. And, and, and we play for each other. Um, they are selfless. I mean, I've never seen a better group of teammates than I've seen put on the Great Britain baseball uniform. And they make me proud every day with just the ways that they constantly lift each other up and think about one another. And it's such an important thing, not only in the game, but in life. Um, and lastly, we're relentless. And if you watched either of those two teams play, then you know exactly what I mean when you see this word up on screen. Uh, Great Britain baseball never gave up. Uh, didn't matter what the score was, what the inning was, who we were playing, you know, they gave our best, um, you know, and we're going to continue to do that through the winter, through this spring through this year's tournaments and all the way up to LA 2028 um, and beyond. That's our goal. Um, so with that, I'm done. I really want to thank you guys all for the opportunity. Once again, thank you know the BBF for their support. Thank BSUK. Thank all of my staff, coaches, players, families, everyone. Um, it's been a fantastic honor to have to have this chance to speak and represent this program. And I look forward to doing it for another year. Drew, thank you. Um, I love your energy and passion, and that comes over in bucketfuls in your, your presentations. Um, I would like to open up the floor for any questions uh, to be either Drew or Rachel through the chat function, if that's okay. Um, just wondering if anybody has any questions that they want to pose at this point. Just seen in the chat, there's a question from Aspie about what can we as British baseball clubs do to support the GB teams. Um, and, and I think my comment would, would, would be twofold. One, 
get in touch. Um, we've got a, a, a wildly expanded coaching staff and we are putting together a lot of resources ourselves um, to make sure that, that we're consistent in what we're talking to players, whether they're 12 or whether they're 45. And we're more than willing to share that um, with clubs, you know, and to make sure that we're, we're coordinating and talking about the athletes that we share um, and the pathway that we both need to provide to them to achieve their dreams. So you're part of that. And I would certainly ask, you know, don't hesitate to get in touch, um, ask questions. We want to be accessible and we want to share information, but just encourage your players to, to, you know, to get after it and, you know, focus on the fundamentals and, and, and don't be afraid to dream. Great. Thanks, Drew. Rachel, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think just from a softball community, it's, it's a little bit the same. Get out, support the sides, support the players. You know, we have, I know a lot of them are based overseas, but there are a couple of homegrown talents in our team, Chloe Wigginton, Amy Hutch, you know, they're, they've been around for a long time. Support them, encourage them, get every little girl and boy playing fast pitch softball. That would be our goal. I think Colin would agree to that from a men's fast pitch point of view as well. You know, we want, we want everyone playing and loving the game. Um, and one thing I was reflecting on when I was listening to, to Drew, and what Andre said is, if your dreams don't scare you just a little bit, they're not big enough. So I think that's kind of what every every player, no matter whether your dream is to play for GB or to play for your Division One side in, you know, in slow pitch or whatever it might be, I think get out there and live it. Great. Uh, any last quick questions? Uh, one from David in Hong Kong. Hi, welcome to Hong Kong. I told you this was an international uh, summit this year. Um, quite a few players went to the UK for the past year. Would like to find out how to help them continue in the game. So these players are national team players. Anyone can help me find contacts, teams, clubs. Um, is that something, Drew, that you'd be able to pick up um, directly with David? Certainly. Um, I mean, I would start by looking on the BSUK Club Finder and looking for a local club if they don't have one, because there are quite a few around, and that's a good place to start. Um, but beyond that, you know, I mean, get, again, get in touch. I think this presentation is going to get shared, and you got my contact information on there. So. You know, if, if the BSUK club finder can't help you, then I certainly will try. Thank you. I just promised to be back to David. Um, please continue that chat in the chat function if you're trying to connect in players from with clubs and leagues. Um, again, thank you, Drew. Thank you, Rachel. Um, certainly the next six years um, are looking exciting. Um, and, and some of the words that um, Andre used in his presentation of daunting and inspirational and exciting all, all come to mind in, in equal measures when we look at what we've got to do over the next uh, six years towards LA 2028. Um, thank you both for your contributions. Before I hand over and introduce Gary Anderson, I just wanted to um, uh, remind you that today is the launch of the Coach Summit series. We've got a further nine workshops uh, over the next um, two months, uh, each of which take on different aspects of technical, tactical, uh, some strength and conditioning work. Um, and the first of those is this coming Wednesday, 2nd of February. Uh, all sessions start 7.30 and uh, will conclude by 9. Um, and there's a, a variety of different speakers with some very di different and interesting background. So Gary McCoy starts us off, a former Team Australia uh, and MLB coach looking at the strength and conditioning, followed by John Skaggs from Primetime Baseball with a couple of sessions of infielding, outfielding, um, through to Bobby. Uh, and then we move into some fast pitch work with Alison. Uh, one of the things I, I'm always uh, intrigued about is the transferable skills between baseball and softball. And so much of the content can be and will be shared between coaches of, of all formats. Um, so please do uh, take time to attend those. As part of your registration to the Coach Summit series, you will receive directly um, uh, joining instructions for all, all of those nine future uh, sessions coming up over the next uh, eight or nine weeks. So um, please do attend those uh, 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 based on the themes and the, and the uh, ideas that are within them. So uh, to conclude this year's Coach Summit, uh, I'd very much like to welcome Gary Anderson to uh, the summit. Um, Gary's a recent addition to uh, the baseball softball um, community. Uh, Gary's a long-standing um, with many, many years of experience in performance sports, uh, with previous roles at um, British Judo and British Bobsled and Skeleton, amongst others. He, he has a huge experience in the talent uh, world, 
and will certainly be helping both baseball and softball programs in their uh, aspirations to qualify and medal in LA 2028. Uh, Gary, very welcome to join us. Um, nice to see you. Um, I'll pass on to you for, for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, thanks, Chris, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, one problem I do have, Chris, here is I can't share my screen. I'm having to use somebody else's office at the moment, and that's probably why there's a lot of movement in the background. Uh, because of the London traffic has prevented me getting to where I needed to be. So I can't share my screen. Um, I did send the presentation through to various people. Is anybody able to share the screen? Chris, just checking if you have a copy of Gary's presentation to share. Unfortunately, I do not. Okay, let me try um, and do my very best here. Gary, if you send it to one of us, we could share it on your behalf. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I may have found it, Gary. Give me two seconds. Thank you. I'm trying it's to download the, it. It's the security here at Team GB House will not let me share, unfortunately. I do hope it's worth waiting for as well. While we have a moment here, uh, once again, this is Chris Knobloch speaking in the background here. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in uh, from in the chat, if you'd like. Uh, always interesting to see who's uh, been able to join our our summits. Uh, I think the most we've most different countries have had is somewhere in the mid 20s. So um, it'll be great to see uh, how far the Coach Summit has gone this year. Um, also, if you have any feedback that you'd like to provide about the Coach Summit, please feel free to do so. You can email it to info at bsuk.com. I will put that in the chat as well. Um, it will all be done in confidence and we can make sure to pass that on to the various um, organizers and speakers. Nearly there, okay. Gary. Thank you, Chris. And apologies for this. It's, um... Looks like so far, David is uh, tuning in from the furthest distance and also at the um, latest hour of the evening, 1.20 a.m. in Hong Kong. Gary, the presentation will be popping up in a moment. So just give me two seconds and we will be ready to go. Gary, you are all set. Presentation's up. Thank you. And um, I will uh, prompt you when I need to move on. So first of all, thank you very much for having me at uh, your, your COPE Summit. I was very excited to see the uh, people that I will be presenting with. So, um, and also a big thank you to everybody in the baseball and softball community in the UK that has welcomed me in the last couple of weeks. I've been you know, so uh, grateful for the way that uh, you've welcomed me into your family, which has been really exceptional for me. So if we could uh, move on to the next one, uh, please, whoever's controlling. All oh, right. OK. Um, I, I just want to talk very briefly about my coaching philosophy and uh, throughout my years. And uh, there's been many of them in sport. I've been very lucky to, to have worked in a number of sports and been to a number of Olympic Games. And I, I often refer to something as the Italian coffee effect, which is part of my coaching philosophy. And the, the analogy I'm using here is that 
I drink a lot of coffee. I have a really good coffee maker at home. I, I buy the best coffee beans. I've got the best grinder. I use good quality water. I, I get the machine serviced so the pressure is right. But the, the, the coffee never tastes like it does when I'm in Milan. Okay, so the, it's the Italian coffee effect. And a lot of my coaching and when I'm working with teams, I like to use that analogy of the Italian coffee effect, which is where the work that I do with the teams that I support in the coaching environment is that we have this Italian coffee effect. If we can move on, Chris, to the next slide. And it was really important for me to, to use the, the, this, this uh, analogy and this um, saying that the work, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I'm sure you've all heard Aristotle say that, um, that uh, the sum you know, is, of its parts you know, is, has to be greater. And the same is with, uh, with coaching and with the teams that I put together. And if we could move to the next slide, please. The three pillars of, of how I operate in um, is the teamship element of any team that I'm leading. Okay, and every team that I lead, and I, hopefully even with, with my very short interaction with both Drew and Rachel, who I'm sure have just given you excellent presentations, is that everything is coach led. The coach, the head coach leads the process. Okay, and that process has to be athlete focused and performance driven. So everything we do within the program has to be for an athlete. And I will question any coach that's working on my programs, whatever sport it is, is how is the athlete going to benefit from what we do here? And when we've decided that it's going to be the best for the athlete, that then has to drive the performance. So coach-led, athlete-focused and performance-driven. If we could move on to the next slide. So managing high performance support teams, which was the, the, the title of the presentation that I was given today. And just so that we've got uh, an idea of how I define what a high performance support team is, it's a team of individuals, all with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose with a performance goal and approach for which they all hold themselves mutually accountable. And that's really important that they hold themselves accountable for it. And we go back to the Italian coffee effect, where the output of that team must be greater than the individual value. And I'll talk more about that as we go through this presentation now. And it, it's really important that we keep in the back of our minds that Italian coffee. Okay, next slide, please. So as I said, athlete-centered, coach-led, performance-driven. So delving a little bit below that as well, it has to be services supporting. So all of the services that support the performance process, be it medical, be it science, be it analysis, has to support that coach-led program that delivers to the athlete. That will then allow the athletes to, what I call, win under pressure. Okay, we need to learn how to win under pressure because at the very top end of sport, whatever the sport is, there will be pressure to win. And also performing on demand. And we all know that in the Olympic Games, in the Olympic environment, you don't get a second chance to perform. You have to perform on demand. And the same goes for any game that we have. We, when, when we play a game of baseball, softball, whatever, football, whatever, there is a set amount of time that we have to perform in, and that's called performing on demand. And we teach our athletes to do that with the services supported, performance-driven coach-led program. It's also interesting that we then look and ask this question, is it what we want or is it what we need? And that's where working with athletes with a service support we find out is, you know, it's very easy for us all to say as a coach, I used to say it as well. I would like this. I want that. I want this. But really, is it what we need? And when we look at that, I have a saying as well. Good is the enemy of great. OK, if we want to be good at something, there's always someone else that wants to be great. And that's what we've got to be careful of. OK, next slide, please. 
Okay, now I'm getting down to a little bit now where I, I get a little bit passionate about these types of things as coaching. I, I, I'm really passionate about coaching. I'm really passionate about human behavior. And you know, when, when we're putting teams of people together, I like to see that interaction. If I go and watch a game, uh, a game of football, a game of rugby, uh, or I'm courtside at a basketball game, my eyes are often drawn to the bench and seeing the coach interaction with the players. Uh, obviously, we all like to see the game that's going on, but I like to watch the behaviour. And so any team that I work with, the first thing we look at is the purpose and identity. And the question we need to ask ourselves, why are we here? When we can resolve the answer to that question, we get a purpose, a personal fit, and people feel that they're part of that process. Okay, We get proper membership. If that isn't resolved, we get a lot of suspicion and fear and uncertainty. And yeah, we lose that little bit of trust and empathy amongst everybody. So first thing is purpose and identity, making sure that any team that I'm associated with knows why we are here. Then it moves on to the respect and trust, another pillar which is really, really important in my philosophy. And that's who are you? Uh, what is your role within that? And when we resolve that, the support team achieves mutual regard. We are able to question each other without any uh, fear of anybody being you know, uh, dug out for anything. We get spontaneous interaction. If we don't resolve that respect and trust, then people are cautious. People are always guarded. Um, and we need to have a really, really safe environment in which we can we can analyze everything we do. Really safe environment where we can question and challenge. And we question and challenge each other. And that has to be safe in order for everybody to do that. I'm, I'm big on culture. And I, I genuinely believe that culture, I could give you the best, the very best uh, cultural document. But culture is, you know, it's it's not a written thing. It's how we act and how we behave. And then probably the most important is we have to have clear roles and clear responsibilities. Who does what, when they do it and where they do it. Okay, And everybody has to understand everybody else is role. When we can resolve that, we can operate as a team, clear, integrated goals, and everybody knows what everybody else is doing. If we can't resolve that and people don't understand people's roles, that question can often lead to misguided competition, apathy, distrust and blame. And once you start getting that involved, it's hard enough to win without that sort of thing going on. So we need to be really clear. So purpose and identity, respect and trust, clear roles and responsibility. Next slide, please. I just have to say a culture shift doesn't happen overnight, okay? And it's, you know, when you move into the Olympic environment, um, you, you, you're suddenly having to report to lots of different agencies and uh, that culture shift, you know, takes a while to embed. And the end result doesn't always tell the entire story. And, you know, there's a quote here, um, which uh, happened on Eurosport in 2014, just before, the team I was leading went to uh, the Olympic Games in Russia. And uh, we made history just before the Olympic Games where we took a silver medal at a World Cup. And uh, the commentators made it very clear that judging by our reaction, this was the staff reaction, not the athletes, that uh, we may have split the atom, uh, atom, solved the debt crisis and married Angelina Jolie. I think that typified exactly how pleased we were at um, performing on demand, as I said before, uh, to make sure that you know, everybody was, was ensured we were in the right place at the right time. So the next slide, please. Another thing that is, I'm very big on my philosophy that external observations are usually snapshots and they're very limited and most certainly not always the full picture, okay? We, it's very easy for people to give advice, give guidance, whatever. And I'm given guidance and advice every single day, um, but it's not always going to be implemented. So people's gu advice and guidance may never be tested. So it's never going to be proven right or wrong. Um, so 
as coaches, I I try and support my my coaches by saying that you know the observations made from outside and externally, they're 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 limited, and it's only the people that are fully involved in that process that really understand what is going on, and then they have to then act on that. And my job is certainly in baseball and softball is to support the coaching network, support the coaching team to ensure that they have everything they need in order to perform. Next slide, please. So when dealing with these athletes, I, I always say to, to athletes, I, I have a number of questions when I work with them and coaches as well, is that when anything goes wrong and things will go wrong, um, is the athlete feel it worse than anyone? They don't need to be reminded of that. You know, the athletes will always feel it worse. And my top tip is, yeah, if things have gone wrong, the, the one question that you can ask an athlete, is there anything I can do for you? Okay, be really genuine um, and yeah, make sure that, uh, you know, will you show empathy to everybody? And as a coach, you have one job and in your career and that is you know that you leave the sport or the athletes in a far better condition than when you arrived if you did do that if everybody did that then we you know they'd be doing their job as a coach next slide please any coach comes to me and says you know um what advice do i give um it's get yourself an excellent support network trusted confidence who tell you what it really is um, and care about your ethos um, you need a lot of good people alongside you um, and always choose a good mentor i over the years i've had a number of good mentors that i've kept in touch with um, and you know there i find myself in positions sometimes where i'm going to people that i used to mentor for advice now um, I've been around long enough and I'm, I'm pretty old now. So I often end up going to speak to people that uh, I often been around and, you know, having the right people in the right place and working with you that understand. So any young coach that comes to me now and asks for advice, it's get yourself a good support network. Okay, the last slide. And my performance mantra is life is not fair. Sometimes crap happens and the goalposts do move. Those three things, you know, I think if every single coach takes that on board and lives their life with that mantra, not a lot can phase you. OK, and I, I've made a, a, a pledge to the coaches that I'm going to be working with with baseball and softball now is that, you know, that if the goalpost moves, I'm there to help them move them back to where they need to be or you know, prevent the, those goalposts from being moved too far away. Yeah, be alongside them when life isn't fair and, and when the crap happens, we all clear it up. Um, so it, it's been a, a pretty rushed presentation here, but I just, you know, yeah, I could go on for hours and hours talking about my life and coaching, uh, the, how lucky I've been, been around the world, worked with lots of teams, won medals, lost medals. Um, but I, I just want to make it very clear that I'm here to give all of the coaches that I'm going to be working with, with baseball and softball, the, the benefit of my experience and do everything I can to ensure that we, we achieve our goal, which, you know, when I signed up to this, it's to, to medal in 2028. It's not to qualify for 2028, it's to medal in 2028. And everybody so far has shared that philosophy. And it's one thing that uh, I, I really hope that I get another opportunity to speak to you as a group like this, uh, go into more depth about coaching, more depth about my how my role is going to be. I, when I was first asked to speak here, I was going to talk to you all about all the things we're going to do, everything that I'm going to do. But at the end of the day, that's down to the coaches. You know, it's not what I think they need um, or, or what they want. It's what's going to be required in order to, to deliver the medal in 2028. So, Chris, very rushed, but a little insight to my philosophy. And uh, I just hope everybody goes and has a good coffee. In Italy, in Italy. If, if it's in Milan, I'll, I'll support you with that one, Gary, for sure. <laughs> it uh, tastes thank, better, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it does. Um, thanks for your thoughts uh, today, Gary. Um, appreciate you've had some technical, technological problems to work through as well. 
um, but it's rounded out, uh, I think, a very interesting hour's worth of input from, from Rachel Drew and yourself around uh, the inward investment that baseball and softball are, are now in receipt of uh, and the exciting path ahead of us um, towards between now and, and Los Angeles 2028. I will open up the chat to see if there's any uh, further questions um, from the group, uh, but I'm sure Gary will become a more familiar um, member of the baseball and softball coaching uh, fraternity as we as we go ahead uh, and move across the next five to six years. Um, certainly, uh, from what I've seen, it's uh, in very safe hands under Gary, Rachel and Drew and their respective coaching staff's hands. Um, and I think with the inward investment into those national team programmes, one of the key pieces of work is to make sure that uh, everybody in our communities are impacted by that, whether that's more access to better coaching, better CPD, um, better connection with programs and, and opportunities that will arise from the inward investment um, over time. So, um, yeah, exciting times ahead. I'm just checking to see if there's any questions in the box. Gary, thanks for sharing your uh, email address with everybody. I'll give everyone... Uh, 30 seconds just to see if there's any final questions, thoughts, comments. Okay, I'm not seeing anything pop up immediately. Um, that just leaves me to conclude and wrap up the, uh, the launch of the Coach Summit for this, uh, for 2022. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters. Uh, again, high quality, thought provoking, stimulating, challenging. Um, but supportive in, in equal measure. So to Andre, to Rachel, to Drew and to Gary, thank you for giving up your time on a, on a Saturday to help us with the, with the launch of the Coach Summit. Uh, a reminder that uh, there is the first of nine sessions starting on Wednesday, the 2nd of February um, at 7.30 to 9. Join instructions are, are in your box, uh, in your inbox, and that will be with Gary McCoy looking at strength and conditioning. Um, uh, a shout out again to uh, the baseball outlet for their continuing support both to the Coach Summit and to the British Baseball Coaching Softball Awards. Um, uh, 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 congratulations again to everybody who was nominated, shortlisted, and, and the seven winners of the, of the awards this year. Um, much appreciated, and, and thank you uh, to everybody for giving your time on a Saturday uh, to help us launch this, um, this Coach Summit for, for 2022. I hope it's been of use. I hope the next uh, nine sessions will equally help you in your journey as a coach to progress and um, allow baseball and softball to progress as we want it to in this country. Um, safe journeys if any of you are traveling, enjoy the rest of your evenings. Many thanks for joining. Um, and that's the conclusion of it. Thank you.